Welcome, welcome, welcome. I would like to welcome you to episode 375 of the Unpopular Podcast. This is the man, the myth, the legend, Jalen Hunter. And here at the Unpopular Podcast, I'm not really asked you to agree with me. I'm asking you to hear me out. As we're getting close to the halfway point of the NFL season, we're starting to get a clearer picture of how good a team is, how bad a team is, areas of improvement that a team needs. We're starting to get a clear picture of just the, the tier rankings or the tiers of NBA of NFL teams. You have Super Bowl caliber teams, you have playoff caliber teams, you have teams that are mediocre in the middle and then you just have downright bad teams. That that picture is starting to get clear and The first game I want to talk about was the Eagles against the Dolphins in week seven of the NFL season. I was so quick to anoint the Miami Dolphins as the best team in football. I mean, you're you're hanging 70 on an NFL team's head. You have probably the most explosive offense. You definitely have the fastest offense, and your defense is pretty good. I think I came on here and said that this Miami Dolphins team is for sure a Super Bowl favorite at this point. I think that was after. I I took the Kool-Aid, and I saw them hang 70 on the Broncos' head. And I was like... I, it doesn't matter how good the Broncos is. If you put 70 on an NFL team's head, that is crazy. That is, that's next level. There's a reason why this only happened, I think, maybe three or four times ever. So I was, I was there. <laughs> I, I let that game and the fact that going into week seven, they were five and one. I let that affect how I felt about this team. But I need to take a step back. After watching the Eagles beat the Dolphins 31 to 17, I need to take a step back and realize exactly what I was looking at. And exactly what we're seeing out of this Miami Dolphins team. First and foremost, Week seven, they had, I think, five starters out. So they're, you can't really make a solid, concrete assessment of this Miami Dolphins team because they were missing a bunch of starters. Five starters is a lot. I think th- three on the offense and two on the defense. But even in that, the games that... We talked about a couple weeks ago or a couple episodes ago, we talked about measuring stick games. And the Miami Dolphins haven't had too many measuring stick games. They've had two of them. They went up against the Buffalo Bills and they went up against the Eagles. Both games they have lost. Now, of course, they're going to beat the Giants. They're going to beat the Denver Broncos. They're going to beat teams like that. But when we talk about measuring stick games, when we talk about the teams that you could arguably see in the playoffs, they've lost. I talked about this when we talked about measuring stick games. Those games are more important because those are your competition. Again, there's tiers. And... As bad as the Denver Broncos have been, they're not in the same tier as the Miami Dolphins. Nobody, at least at this point of the season, should view the Denver Broncos on in the same class as the Miami Dolphins. No one should view the Giants in the same class as the Dolphins. But you would view maybe the Buffalo Bills in the same class or maybe the Eagles, and they've lost both. Now, I'm not saying that We should just throw the Dolphins away. I'm not saying that the Dolphins are frauds. I'm not saying that the Dolphins are just trash and and they're just beating trash teams. What I'm saying is 
maybe more against the Eagles than the Bills. There are things that the Dolphins need to work on, obviously, and you have time to work on them. But I am, again, I, and I also talked about this a couple episodes ago. There's no such thing as moral victories, in my opinion. But I would feel better. I'd feel okay as a Dolphins fan after losing to the Eagles more than I, I would feel after they lost to the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills almost beat them by like like almost put 50 on their head. Because you're out a bunch of starters and you only lost it the loss wasn't as bad as the record as the record showed. I would feel better as the Miami Dolphins. Now, there are a couple things that need to be worked on obviously. For instance, Tua still Tua was great. Don't get me wrong. Tua is really good. His connection with his wide receivers, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, they're they're exceptional. And when they're on they're, when they're firing on all cylinders, it is damn near impossible to beat. But there are still times when Tua holds the ball a little bit too long, or that offensive line kind of breaks down against good pass rushes. Or they go for the big plays a little bit too much, and there are times when they just don't take the gimmies. I understand when you have an offense this explosive, you want to go for the big plays. The big plays, not only are they big plays, but they are demoralizing to a team that you're going against. But there are times when you just need to take the checkdowns. There are times when you just need to take the gimmies. And it seems like, at least at this point in the season, the Miami Dolphins go for the big plays way more than they do or way more than they should. I'll say that. I'm not saying that they should change their game. I'm saying that they should they should incorporate what's easy. They should incorporate th- things that need to be need to be not every play can be a 20-yard bomb, can be a 30-yard bomb. That's what I'm saying. And on top of that, the rushing game. Now, again, Numbers can numbers don't tell the whole story in sports. I know they say numbers never lie. Very true. But numbers do not tell the whole story. If you look, you'd think that this Miami Dolphins team is a great rushing. They they put up what? Seven, I think, rushing touchdowns or maybe yeah, maybe seven rushing touchdowns on the Denver Broncos since that game. And losing Achan, they have not been the best running. I mean, Raheem Morstert hasn't been that explosive, hasn't been that good. Now, it could be a couple games, but again, against the Bills, against the Eagles, he, the running game was non-existent. Raheem Morstert ran for nine carries for 100, I mean, for 45 yards. That's not, that's not going to cut it. Now, again, I'm not saying that I'm not throwing away the Dolphins. I'm not saying the Dolphins are trash. I'm not saying that the Dolphins are not Super Bowl caliber teams or is not a Super Bowl caliber team. But what I am saying is at this iteration, we need to see them at least win a couple of these measuring stick games. They've had two of them and they've lost both. Again, you're playing against, you're, you're destroying the Dolphins. I mean, not the Dolphins. You're destroying the Giants. You're destroying the Denver Broncos. Cool. The Denver Broncos damn near lost to the Bears. The Denver Broncos are sitting now at two and what, five? The Giants are what, two and five, three and three and something like that. So all I'm saying is, When I, when I say we need to pump the brakes, I mean I need to pump the brakes on this Miami Dolphins Super Bowl Super Bowl train. I need to pump the brakes for a second because, I, again, I need to see them. I need to see them win. <laughs> I need to see them win against these teams that I believe are in their tier. And the Broncos, the Giants, they are not. And let me go to the Eagles for a second. Because I have come on this podcast week after week after week. 
and talked about how the Eagles don't look right. How the Eagles don't look as dominant as they looked a, a season ago. Now, obviously, I also include that this year's schedule is much tougher than last year's. I also include that they have two new coordinators, both offensive and defensive. So that's going to take some time to gel. But I have come on this podcast and said that the Eagles just don't look right. They just don't look like a team that I can hang my hat and say is a Super Bowl caliber team at how they're playing right now. Well, I was watching the games and I was... I will be honest and say and say that I wasn't taking as much from the result as I should have. I stand by everything I say when I said that the Eagles obviously don't look as dominant as they did a year ago. I stand by that. And I and if you even look statistically, they are not the same team as they were a year ago. And I don't, obviously, nobody knows how this year is going to end. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the Super Bowl. Nobody knows who's going to make the Super Bowl. But even at all that, even with me saying that the Eagles aren't the, aren't the team of last year that essentially made it to the Super Bowl and had a sizable lead before ultimately squandering it, this Eagles team today is 6 and 1. And we'll talk about the 49ers, we'll talk about the top of the NFC, but right now the Eagles are 6 and 1. And they've beaten everyone they need to beat now outside of one team. And while I think we're going to see the real Eagles in these next few weeks, the first test is is complete. They beat the most explosive offense in football in the Dolphins. And I also want to shout out the yo, I'm not going to talk about it this episode extent like I'm not really going to talk about it at all, but yo, they look. I don't know what's going on with this NBA city jerseys. Almost all of them are trash. The Wizards one is garbage. They're trash. Okay? I just, I don't understand why we continue to, why don't we let jerseys live, man? Why don't we let jerseys thrive? I, you know what? I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it for the unpopular topic of the day. But what I will say is, shouts out to the Eagles for beating the Dolphins 31-17. to Shouts out to the Eagles for those Kelly Green jerseys. One of the best throwbacks in football. I still... I don't know, maybe I just have a uh, recency bias cuz those cream sickle jer- those cream sickle bucks jerseys went insane. They're one of the most beautiful jerseys I have ever seen. Again, I could be I just could be a prisoner of the moment. But man, those jerseys, but those Kelly green jerseys. I don't know if I can look at those every week. I think maybe 3 or 4 times a year, which is what they're doing. I think I could do that, but those those that that jersey is beautiful. That Kelly green jersey was beautiful. Again, I don't know. I, I'm not gonna go as far as to say it's better than the cream sickle jersey and the Houston Oilers jersey that we're about to see. Mm, mm, mm. That's all I'm gonna say. But back to the topic at hand. I'm gonna save the city jerseys for later. Unpopular topic of the day. But what I will say is, I think I need to, I stand, again, I stand by everything I say with the Eagles as far as they just don't look the same as last year. But I also, in the same breath, have said that we need to give them time. But even with us giving them time, they are 6-1. And And they continue to win games at a, the same way. Dominant, dominant running game. Jalen Hurt, I mean, Jalen Hurt's doing this thing. May throw an interception here or there, but we'll see. But shouts out to the Eagles. 
I have we have been collectively hard on Justin Herbert and the Chargers. And I think the reason why we have been hard on Justin Herbert and the Chargers is because when you're as talented as Justin Herbert, when you are considered a top five quarterback talent in the NFL, there are times when your your talent is supposed to supersede what's going on around you. That's the same thing we talk about with contracts. One of the biggest reasons why people are so frustrated with the Denver Broncos and Russell Wilson is because you pay Russell Wilson as much money as the Denver Broncos are paying him. He's supposed to be the solution, even if everything around him is the problem. We're going to talk about the Cleveland Browns in a second, but it's the same thing with Deshaun Watson. And it's not just Justin Herbert is a top tier talent. He gets paid like a top tier quarterback. He ha- his team has the most expensive defense in the NFL. So you expect these close games, or you expect these games that you're playing against someone that people would consider a a talent rival. You can you would you would think that those games, the Chargers would fare much better, and as we sit here today, you would think when you put the most when you have the most expensive defense and when you have Justin Herbert, you'd think that you have a winning record. So the fact that neither of which is happening, there's going to be a lot of criticism. There's going to be a lot of talk on this Chargers team and. In particular, Justin Herbert. I hear a lot. First of all, the Kansas City Chiefs beat the Chargers 31 to 17. This was a vintage Patrick Mahomes game. I think he threw for the most yards in a first half in in his NFL tenure. I think it was like 324 or 319 or something like that or 309 or something. I know he finished the game with 424 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. Travis Kelsey went 13 for 12, 179 yards. Again, you expect that from Patrick Mahomes. I know that's gaudy numbers, 400. Throwing for 400 yards in a game is gaudy numbers, but when you're as great as Patrick Mahomes, there's expectations. That's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to get at with this game. There are expectations when you're as good as Patrick Mahomes, when you're as good as Justin Herbert, when you're as good as Travis Kelsey, when you hear 179 yards, 13 for 12, you don't really go like, damn, that's a lot. You go like, well, that's Travis Kelsey, arguably the greatest tight end ever. After this game, I heard a lot of people say that I'm not blaming Justin Herbert for this game. I'm not blaming Justin Herbert for the Chargers being 12 or 2 and 4. And I would say I think two things can be true. I think blame can can land where blame needs to land. And I also think that it can be other factors that cause a team to be as bad as a team is or as good as a team is. I do think that Justin Herbert does lay blame, some blame to the Chargers ultimately being two games under 500. I mean, Justin Herbert has thrown a bunch of interceptions. Now, for the hold on, let, let's let's back up for a second. For the people that continuously come in my comments and continuously try to remind me that Justin Herbert continues he said in NFL records I know <laughs> I know just like you know and that's kind of one of my biggest con- one of my biggest arguments against Justin Herbert is how good he is I know Justin Herbert is a top tier talent but a top tier talent can't 
shouldn't two weeks in a row throw game ceiling interceptions at the end of the game. Now, this game wasn't as close, obviously, and the interception probably wouldn't have mattered too much this game than it did against the Cowboys. You're when you're that talented, you can't you can't do that. I know this wouldn't be a conversation if if Justin Herbert wasn't that good. Nobody would care if Justin Herbert was on the same level as, let's say, Justin Fields right now. It wouldn't matter. But the reason why we we're so critical of Justin Herbert, or let me say, not we. The reason why I am so critical of Justin Herbert is because he is that good. I know he's that good. The fact of you look at Patrick Mahomes and you think, well, 424 yards, that's crazy, but that's Patrick Mahomes. You can say the same thing for Justin Herbert, but the reason you look at, oh, 259 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. Well, that, you know, that. <laughs> mm. trust, trust me, I'm not sitting here saying that. It's just Pat or Justin Herbert's fault. Obviously, I think a lot of blame and probably more blame goes to the coaching staff. Goes to Brandon Staley, goes to the offensive coordinator, goes to the defensive coordinator. Again, you can't have the most expensive defense in football and be as bad defensively as the Chargers are. I don't care if you gave J.C. Jackson back to the Patriots. You should be. You still have Joey Bosa. You still have Khalil Mack. You still have Derwin James. You should be better. Asante Samuel Jr. You should be better than this. Going into the season, both of these teams were looked at as Super Bowl caliber teams. And while I did put, I think I'll put a video out of maybe two episodes ago saying that this Chiefs offense is the biggest hindrance to them winning a Super Bowl right now. Well, as we're seeing, Patrick Mahomes is starting to get a better relationship and starting to trust his receivers more. I mean, Valdez Scaling, who he had 84 four yards. Rasheed Rice had 60 yards with a touchdown. Isaiah Pacheco, 28 receiving yards with a touchdown. He's starting to build confidence with his receivers. So now that defense and the offense are starting to starting to get closer. And that, that way, boy, and the, the Chiefs have like a top five defense in the league. Easy. But this Chargers team, it there should the conversation there's a reason why, talent-wise, there's not that much a gap between Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes. Yet and still, when we look at it, of course, all we see is a gap, a wide gap. Even in, even in records, one is six and one, one is two and four. I don't care. You can, I don't care how good or how bad the team is. When you have someone like Justin or, and you have web pieces, I'm not I know we're we're talking like what about the team? The team is it has it has p names. It has Keenan Allen. It has Gerald Everett. I know he's not a top tier tight end, but you still have Gerald Everett. You still have Alston Eckler. 2 and 4. And while I don't put all the blame on Justin Herbert, there there is some blame that needs to lay at his feet. Because with the talent that he has, he should be more of a solution to this team than he is. And that's just real. Let's move forward. I have said that Brock Purdy is a top 10 quarterback, or at least 
he has been playing as a top 10 quarterback this year. Now, that was obviously after or before he lost two straight games. First time in his career that he's lost two regular season games. I'll first say congratulations to the Minnesota Vikings for beating the San Francisco 49ers 22 to 17. Brian Flores, this defense, the the Minnesota Vikings defense isn't that good and hasn't really been that good this year, but they've been better than last year and I contribute that solely to Brian Flores being their head coach or being their defensive coordinator. A lot of the the a lot of the conversation that we've had around Kirk Cousins in this team is he can't fin he can't win the big games and the Minnesota I mean at this point even with the win the Minnesota Vikings are still below 500 but Kirk Cousins balled out man 378 yards two touchdowns one interception Jordan Addison who was a rookie 123 yards two touchdowns DJ Hawkinson had 86 yards this was an all-around collective game. It was a great game from the Minnesota Vikings. And I, I'm not taking anything away from them. They deserve this win. They It was hard fought. I know a lot of people, including myself, thought that they were going to get destroyed. I was wrong, obviously. And the Minnesota Vikings did their thing. Even with, And I was also, I was, I'm shocked at how good... Kirk Cousins, I know Kirk Cousins has, he's not trash. Let me say that. I say Kirk Cousins is a quarterback that, he's an average quarterback, but he has those games where he plays above average, i.e. this game. But I thought that this Minnesota Vikings offense was just going to fall off the map with Justin Jefferson out. Well, they, I think they've won two straight at this point. Or maybe three straight, I'm not sure. Maybe two straight. But shouts out to the Minnesota Vikings for beating the previous number one team in the NFC, uh, 49ers, 22 to 17. Now back to the 49ers. Brock Purdy. Shannon Sharp and and there have been multi, there have been some people that say that Brock Purdy is not elite. And as we sit here today, it's very hard for me to go against that. Because when you look at the word elite, elite in my opinion, especially when we talk about football, means that you can make whatever you have around you work to a certain extent, obviously. You can't just pick anyone off the street and just be great. But you can make whatever's around you work. I understand that for Monday Night Football, Trent Williams, who is a future Hall of Famer, he's out. Debo Samuel, who has Hall of Fame talent, He's out. But you still have Christian McCaffrey. You still have Brandon Ayuk. You still have George Kittle. The offensive line is still really good. The defense is still the defense. Arguably the top ten, top five, hell, arguably number one defense in football. That should be enough to win these t- – win – against a team like the Vikings. Or who did they lose? The Jets? A team like the Jets. I think it was the Jets. Yeah. Was it the Jets? Might have been. I don't know. Like, that. That's, those are the type of teams that you should win. Type of games that you should win. Even without the people that you, you know, even, with, oh, the it's, the it's the Browns. I'm sorry. It's the Browns. Don't kill me. It's the Browns. 
But Brock Purdy has looked these last two games. Brock Purdy has has not looked. He hasn't looked bad. Let me say that he hasn't looked bad, but he hasn't really looked that good either. He's looked average. Now he hasn't looked like the last pick of the draft, but he doesn't. He hasn't looked like the top ten quarterback that I crowned him to be. And what we've seen these last two games is he, he's starting to turn into, or these last two games, he has been that type of quarterback that needs everything around him to be right. Kind of like a Jimmy G. Now, I will say it does seem like he's better than Jimmy G. But Jimmy G is a type of quarterback that needs everything around him to be to be great and if everything around him is great he is a really good quarterback and as we've seen he's gotten this 49ers team to the Super Bowl Brock Purdy he was a game away from getting to the Super Bowl and if it wasn't for his I think his UCL tearing or getting hurt they could have beat the Eagles I don't know But I, I'll i say this, not every, it doesn't matter how dominant you are. You're not going to have it every week. You can't expect this defense to have it every week, especially if the offense isn't holding up his end of the bargain every week. Now, I'm not saying that the offense is trash, don't hear me wrong, but the offense was not, what, what, and, I, and shouts out to Brian Flores again. What this Minnesota Vikings team did was they said, all right, we are going to shut down Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey is not going to beat us. And that's what happened. Christian McCaffrey did have two touchdowns. But as you can see, that's the only two touchdowns of the game. One of them was a rushing. One of them was a passing. They said, if we lose, it's going to be because Brock Purdy through to these receivers. Now, when you have George Kittle and you have Brandon Ayuk, that should be enough. I understand how much of a hole Debo Samuels leaves. I understand how much of a hole Trent Williams leaves, but you still have at least an all pro type players. And you weren't able to win. And at the end of the game, at least against the Browns, you did enough as far as you put your team in the best situation to win. They just missed the kick. And this time, you threw two costly interceptions. One of which was at the end of the game. So, I'm not going to I'm not going to just throw away Brock Purdy. I'm not saying he's trash. I'm not saying he's not still a top 10 quarterback. I'm not, but I will say to me, his top 10 legitimacy is kind of getting more fragile by the day. And he's starting to turn into that, at least these last two games, he's starting to turn into that quarterback that needs everything to be right around him. Kind of like the quarterback he just played on Monday Night Football, Kurt Cousins. But Kurt Cousins has those nights where it doesn't matter who's around him. He's going to ball out. They haven't really seen that from Brock Purdy just yet. With, with, he's seen that, but you've had Debo, you've had your whole arsenal. Well, when you have a couple of bullets missing, now we're starting to see the type of player that Brock Purdy possibly is. So, shouts out to the Minnesota Vikings again for beating the San Francisco 49ers 22-17. to It's time to be honest about what we're seeing. Not for me. Because <laughs> I've been honest this entire time. It's time to be honest about what we are seeing. There are still people to this day, which is hilarious to me. There are still people to this day that thinks Lamar Jackson is not a good thrower of the football or can't throw the ball or is just a hybrid running back. And I know that because the Ravens beat the Detroit Lions 38 to 6. 38 to 6. 
for people that aren't good at math, that is a 32-point win. Lamar Jackson has 357 yards, three touchdowns. Only ran for 36 yards. Oh, no. Yeah, only ran for 36 yards. And there are people on Sunday after the game still saying Lamar Jackson can't throw the ball. This team is the team that I said could win a Super Bowl, and I ultimately picked the Ravens to win a Super Bowl because of this team. When 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 Lamar Jackson is playing like that, when the wide receivers are catching the ball, I mean, receiving Gus Edwards had 80 yards, Zay Flowers has 75, Mark Andrews has 63, Odell Beckham at 49, Rashard Bateman at 36. That is That is... You don't have that is a equally spread piece of toast right there. When a team is playing that good, and when the Baltimore Ravens are playing, that is the best they could play. From the offensive line to the defense, that is one of the best defenses in football. That is the best. That they could play. And. If they play like this. This is a Super Bowl caliber team. Hands down. Now there was a stat. I'm not going to. Kill the Lions. I'm not going to kill the Lions. Because of this stat. The stat is. That Lamar Jackson is 16 and 1 against NFC teams. Meaning, Lamar Jackson is one of the hardest players to gain to, to scheme around, to game plan for, because he is the one of the most unique quarterbacks in football. With his passing ability, which Quiet as it's kept, and statistically, you can look it up, Lamar Jackson has turned into a top five passer of the football. It is hard to game plan around somebody like Lamar Jackson. And when you're an NFC team and you only see him once, it's like there is nobody in the NFC outside of possibly Jalen Hurts that you can really look and say, all right, we're going to scheme around this player. Or scheme for this player. Lamar Jackson ain't it. Now, yes, I understand the Detroit Lions didn't have David Montgomery, which is their starting running back. That is a big loss. And it just it but you you not only is it Lamar Jackson, it's very hard to gain or scheme and game plan for the type of physicality you're about to experience going against the Baltimore Ravens. Not just this year, their defense, they're, they're all, they've always been one of the most physical teams in football. So it's very hard to scheme against them. I'm, I think Get Up said it. Get, Get Up had a segment where they were talking about bad sign or bad losses. And I think that this was a bad loss for the Detroit Lions. I do think the Detroit Lions are still good. Kind of like the same thing with the San Francisco 49ers. I just think it was a bad loss. These two losses were a bad loss. I don't think that's a bad sign. It's hard going against the Ravens. And like I said, and maybe people are coming around to it. I don't know. But this Ravens team is a Super Bowl caliber team. And I hope that now Lamar Jackson's name is in the MVP talks. Because, again, I also said this was the year Lamar Jackson was going to win his second MVP. And he's played like it. (laughs) And that's another thing that's jarring is you don't see these type of lopsided wins against two good teams. Like, you'll see a team beat maybe the Browns or not Browns, uh, Bears or Broncos like this. 
because their defense aren't that good. But you don't really see this type of blowout win against two top tier teams. That's why I definitely have to give my kudos to, you know, Lamar Jackson. He threw for almost 400 yards. And people are still saying he is not a <laughs> he's not a thrower of the football. It's crazy. So shouts out to the Ravens for beating the Lions 38 to 6. There's 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 a couple ways that you can look at this Browns and Colts game. The Browns beat the Colts 39 to 38. Going into this, the Browns had statistically, I think, the number one defense in football. And one way to look at this game was, well, that makes all the sense in the world. I mean, to me, this game was won solely on the backs of Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett did everything possibly needed to win this game. Block field goals uh, or punts have two strip sacks. Miles Garrett, I said coming into the season that Miles Garrett is the, or no, that I think Nick Bosa or Michael Parsons is the clear-cut best defensive player in the league. Some days is Michael Parsons, some days is Nick Bosa. That's what I said going into the season. Well, as we sit here week seven, it is clear that those two names are not it. They're good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to disrespect Michael Parsons. I'm definitely not disrespecting Nick Bosa. But right now, it seems like the best player, the best defensive player in the world is Miles Garrett. We're going to talk about another player in the same division that can that that also's name can be put in the mix. But right now, it's actually, you know what? It's two players right now. Miles Garrett is definitely up there. Maybe 1A and 1B. I'll talk about 1B a little bit later. So you can look at this game and be like, well, that's why. I mean, you had they're arguably one of the best defenses in football, if not the best. You have Miles Garrett, you have Greg Newsome, you have Denzel Ward. They that's a tough defense. You have Zendarius Smith. That's a tough defense to to uh scheme against. But you can also look at it as, well, if they're the top defense, how the hell did you give up or you gave up 38 points to Garner Minshew? It could have just been one of those games. I don't know. But another conversation out of this game is obviously Deshaun Watson. Now, we talked about Justin Herbert, and I said that when you're someone as good as Justin Herbert – and when you're someone that has the skill set as Justin Herbert, you should be the solution more than part of the problem. And at least this season, it hasn't seemed like Justin Herbert has been much of the solution. Even though he's been good, he hasn't been much of the solution. The same thing can kind of be said for Deshaun Watson. The issue is Deshaun Watson has also been the problem for this Browns team. And if you if you were confused as to how you can tell, this game right here will show you. And the craziest part is Deshaun Watson didn't even play that much because he re-aggravated his... Uh, his his rotator cup. So now he's back to day to day. But this defense is a Super Bowl caliber defense. And it's crazy, even though, yes, they did win by 139 to 38. It's crazy how drastically different they looked with Deshaun Watson being as their starting quarterback and PJ Walker being their starting quarterback pj walker didn't do much don't get me wrong but he didn't he didn't kill the game for them there have been 
couple times this year and last year where Deshaun Watson has shot the Browns in the foot. And what makes it even worse is, of course, that contract. That contract is every single time we talk about Deshaun Watson, that contract will be discussed. Because they, and Dan Graziano said it, man, they're not paying him to be okay. They're not paying him to have a year to get right, seeing as though he missed a bunch of time in the last few years. They're paying him to be right right now. And this team is built to be good right now. Again, this is a Super Bowl caliber roster. And that's another thing. Because uh, Chris Canty said it. Shouts out to Chris Canty. He was talking about the 49ers. And he was saying that the 49ers window is now. Because you have George Kittle getting older. Debo Samuels has been injured a, a bunch of times. Kurt, uh, Christian McCaffrey has been injured a couple times. Trent Williams is getting older. And this defense is built for now. Because you're going to have to start paying people very soon. Or losing people. The same thing can pretty much be said for this Browns team. You Again, I don't know. Zendaria Smith is, I'm not going to say on his last leg, but he's closer to the end than he is the beginning. Miles Garrett is still Miles Garrett. He's going to be great. But at some point, that greatness is going to have to be matched with the offense. You have Amari Cooper. Yeah, I know Nick Chubb got hurt, but you have Kareem Hunt. At some point, this Browns team, I know they're 4 and 2, but when you look at this Browns team, especially with Deshaun Watson as their quarterback, right now, nobody thinks they're a Super Bowl caliber team. We think that they're a Super Bowl caliber defense, but that's it. That's it. You have David Njaku, Elijah Moore, like. I just people are gonna people are always gonna be overcritical of Deshaun Watson because of the off the field stuff and because of the fact that they're paying you the biggest contract in NFL history. Most guaranteed contract in NFL history. And up to this point, nothing about Deshaun Watson's game in Cleveland has justified that contract. But shouts out <laughs> to the Browns for beating the Colts thirty nine to thirty eight. Again, they talked about on first take, not first take. I'm sorry, on Get Up. They they had a segment called Bad Sign or Bad Loss. I think the Forty Nine ers that was a bad loss. I think that. The Miami Dolphins, that was a bad loss because they did, even though they haven't beat a top-tier opponent, they were also missing five starters. I think that the Detroit Lions, that was a bad loss. I don't think it's a bad sign. I just think it's a bad loss. It's very hard to scheme against Lamar Jackson. Again, he's 16-1 and one in the, against the NFC teams. I'm starting to think that the Bills loss is a bad sign. The Bills loss to the Patriots 29 to 25. The Patriots. The Patriot You want to talk about a team that was dead to rights. A team that was ready to fold. A team that had absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. That was the Patriots. Nothing has been going right for the Patriots much this season. Outside of, I think, Bill Belichick got an extension. But outside of that, Mac Jones was regressing. This offense was so bad. They have they have one of the worst offenses in the league. Nothing was there was no light at the end of the tunnel for the for the New England Patriots. 
And that's who the Buffalo Bills lost to. Now, I understand how people are going to try to paint it. People are, you're either going to try to paint it more negatively than it is or more positively than it is. For the people that are going to paint it more positively, you're going to say, well, it's a divisional opponent. Okay. Well, it's a division opponent. And remember, Matt Milano's out and Tredarius White's out. Okay. But you still have Josh Allen, who people are continuous, continuously saying is an elite quarterback. Is a quarterback that should be in the same tier as a Patrick Mahomes or a Lamar Jackson or a Joe Joe uh Joe Burrow. That is who when when we're discussing top tier quarterbacks. Josh Allen's name usually goes into that. You have Stefan Diggs, who is clearly a top five wide receiver in the league. This shouldn't, this, you shouldn't lose. If you're going to lose to a team, you, you should, kind of like the Dolphins, if you're going to lose to a team, you should lose to a team that people are considered in your tier or close to your tier. Nobody should consider the Buffalo Bills in the same tier as the Patriots. But the reason why I say that it seems like it's a bad sign because the issues that the Buffalo Bills have struggled with for years are still prevalent today. Josh Allen throwing terrible interceptions. The defense falling apart in the last or when it needs to when it needs to rise up again I understand Milano and Javius White not being there is huge but this isn't just a this year thing this has been happening for years now you know what happened I'm be real with you <clears throat> what happened was we took one year and one game and maybe put more into that than we should the entire package. One thing that I like to do, I got this from Colin Cowherd, so shouts out to him. One thing that I like to do is I like to take the worst season out and I like to take the best season out. And that is the type of player that you have. That is the averages of the player. Of course, the worst season usually for a top tier quarterback is their rookie year or their first year that they get to start. And you take that out and then you take out the year where the Buffalo Bills made it to the AFC, the AFC championship. Was it the AFC championship? It wasn't made it to the second round of the playoffs going up against Patrick Mahomes and have one of the greatest endings we've ever seen to a playoff game. Take that out. What is Josh Allen? Josh Allen is a quarterback that is very erratic, that throws a bunch of interceptions. That is a he's he's a good runner of the football, but sometimes he tries to he tries to go head up with instead of just sliding, instead of just going out of bounds. I don't know if he just loves the hit, but he he'll go for the hit. Like, dude, what are you doing? You have a defense that's not that good. Even with now, I know this was Von Miller's what first game, or she's still trying to figure it out. Maybe second game, but this defense isn't that good, especially with the people that are you know Milano and and White, especially with them out. It's not that good. The running game isn't that great. James Cook had fifty six yards. What I'm saying is, the reason why I said that this is a bad sign because. The the I don't see the Bills collectively getting better year after year. And what's even worse is I don't even see them getting worse. They're just the Bills. And even with that, they where they are is not Super Bowl contender. 
and they're not a Super Bowl contender because they haven't been. They haven't even been to the AFC Championship. Josh Allen hasn't touched an AFC Championship. As great as we think Josh Allen is, he hasn't touched the AFC Championship. Now, people are going to throw, well, what about some of the names that you said? What about Lamar Jackson? Lamar Jackson's been hurt these last, what, two years? Like, you know, Lamar Jackson only has one playoff win. Okay. We're not talking about Lamar Jackson. We're talking about somebody that people widely view Josh Allen to be much better than Lamar Jackson. Well, you lost to the Patriots. Now, I understand Lamar Jackson lost to the Colts. But as we sit here today, the Colts have a much better future right now than the Patriots. This Buffalo Bills team, man, it's, I don't see any, the only thing I see special right now is an occasional flash of Josh Allen being Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. And I understand that this might seem a bit of an overreaction, seeing as though they're four and three. And they did beat the Dolphins. But that to me in and of itself is the issue. It's not the fact of they can't be great. It's the fact that they're so inconsistent that it's hard for me to put the Bills in great category. Because they sh- they deserve to be there. They should be there. But they're way more inconsistent than they are consistent. If they were more consistent, if the team that we saw, the Buffalo, if, if the if the Buffalo Bills team that we saw beat the Dolphins showed up every single week, oh yeah, no. That that is a Super Bowl caliber team. The issue is, and the biggest reason why really nobody has the Bills as a Super Bowl contender right now is because they just are so inconsistent. That's it. Continue, shouts out to the Patriots for beating the Bills 29 to 25. Let me first say shouts out to Tyrod Taylor for being the first African American quarterback to win as a starting quarterback for the Giants in like Giants history. Shouts out to you. The Giants beat the Washington Commanders 14-7. to Now, the biggest story out of this game was obviously after the game where Jonathan Allen just kind of went crazy, pretty much saying, you know, he's tired of this. It's been seven years, and it's been the same old, same old. Here's a couple stats for you. Sam Howell is on record to be the most sacked quarterback in NFL history for a season. Beating or he's on track to surpass David Carr. As we sit here today, Ron Rivera as a head coach has a losing record still. In fact, Ron Rivera has only had one. Winning record. In the second half of this game, or first half, I'm sorry, in the first half of this game, Terry McLaurin, the best offensive player on this team, Received one target. I'll tell you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. 
Washington had 10 punts this game. In fact, here's where the drive here's here's was here was the drive track. Punt, 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 interception, punt, 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 touchdown, punt, punt, missed field goal, turnover on downs. Game over. I understand that there's excitement around Washington because of, you know, Dan Snyder not being there anymore. But if we talk about the product on the field, there's not really much to be happy about right now as a Washington fan. In fact, I think that there's more to be upset about than happy because we have names. I've said this almost weekly at this point. We have names. Like when you're on a on a board, you have a whiteboard, right? And on the whiteboard, you're just putting down great names. You're putting down names of players that are really good in the NFL. There are a bunch of, there are a couple names That'll be on that that'll be on that board from Washington. You know, Terry McLaurin. I think that Terry McLaurin is one of the most underrated players in the league, but that's probably because of the team he plays on. Chase Young might be up there. Jonathan Allen might be up there. The Montez Sweat might be up there. Deron Payne might be up there. All those names might be up there on that board of really good players. Really good to great players. All those names would probably be up there. Yet and still, as we sit here today, Washington is 3 and 4. And Washington Washington has lost to the Giants and the Bears. Again, I'm not one to overreact. I'm not one to be hyperbolic. I'm not one to call for somebody's job. But what I will say is, under Ron Rivera, right? I think this is year four of Ron Rivera. Has this team gotten any better? With the names that we've said, I understand Chase Young was out. Most of last year due to injury. But Jonathan Allen wasn't. Deron Payne wasn't. Montez Sweat wasn't. Terry McLaurin wasn't. Has this team gotten any better since Ron Rivera has been the head coach? Again, mind you, we lost to Tyrod Taylor, who, in his defense, is a pretty solid backup quarterback. But that's what he is, a backup quarterback. Shouts out to the Giants for beating Washington fourteen to, or yeah fourteen to seven. Well deserved win. Yet another week where Washington lost to a team that you should have beat. And another thing before I go or before I move on is the same issues. Kind of we talked about the Bills, the same issues that have permeated this Washington team. Are the same issues that they have today. Outside of Dan Snyder, obviously, we have one of the worst offensive lines in football, which is why Sam Howell is on track to be the most sacked quarterback in NFL history. We have one of the worst secondaries in football. And we have an underachieving defensive front. Ah, oh, boy. Shouts out to the Giants, man. Speaking of underachieving. The the Broncos beat the the Packers 19 to 17. 
another team where you want to talk about not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, the Denver Broncos have been, I mean, they, they are, <laughs> they're in war rooms trying to figure out how to get off of this Russell Wilson's contract. While I don't think that Russell Wilson has been the biggest problem this year, kind of like Justin Herbert to a very much extensive, more bigger <laughs> uh, ex- situation. Russell Wilson has not been the solution. But this game wasn't about the Denver Broncos. This game wasn't about Russell Wilson. This game was about just Jordan Love and how bad Jordan Love has has looked. I understand that it's going to take time for, for a quarterback to develop. And I understand, I think Dan Olowski was talking about they were breaking down this film and Jordan Love is doing things and has developed things, mechanics that Aaron Rodgers used to do, obviously seeing as though Aaron Rodgers was in front of him and he was learning from Aaron Rodgers. The issue with that is Aaron Rodgers is one of the greatest throwers of the football we have ever seen. Jordan Love is not. Jordan Love has not been good. Jordan Love, I believe, has thrown more interceptions in the last few games than touchdowns. Jordan Love is the biggest reason why they lost this game to the Denver Broncos. A Denver Broncos team that will go down as probably one of the worst teams, at least defenses, in football. I understand that it was it was exciting coming out the gate. I think they went 2-0 and or something. But it's been pretty bad since. To the fact that I think a couple weeks ago, Zaire Alexander came out and said that we just can't let them score more than, what, 14, 15 points. They scored 19, and you lost. Now, I understand there are some starters out. I get that. But you still have... <laughs> Romeo Dobbs, you still have Christian Watson. You still have A.J. Dillon, you still have Aaron Jones. And you don't register a point in the first half. Jordan Love has not been good. In fact, Jordan Love has been bad. Very bad. That's just... I know Packers fans don't want to hear that. He's been bad. The The Packers fans that came to me talking about, I don't know what I'm talking about, and Jordan Love's going to be just, just good, or Jordan Love's going to be just fine, or there's no drop-off between Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers. Okay. The proof is in the, the, proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. That's all I'm going to say about that. Shouts out to the Broncos for beating the Packers 19-17. The Bears got their second win of the season against the Raiders, 30-12. to This was the battle of the backups. Justin Fields was out. Jimmy Garoppolo was out. It was Brian Hoyer against Tyson Bag- Bagnet. First of all, let me say, I don't know. I know I'm going to butcher your last name, bro, so I'm just going to call you Tyson. Shouts out to Tyson for winning his first NFL start. He was a D2 quarterback. I think the first D2 quarterback to ever win uh, in the NFL. I was like, a, yeah, yeah. I think. Shouts out to you, bro. He he was he was great. Twenty one for twenty nine, one hundred and six, one hundred and sixty two yards, one touchdown. He also ran for three three carries, twenty four yards. He was great, man. He was the best player out there, which is crazy to think about. So shouts out to him, man. I I want to take time to shout out to Tyson, uh, Baggett, Bagnet, Bagant. 
I don't know how to say your name. Last name, bro. I apologize. Shouts out to you. You know who I haven't heard much criticism about this year, which I think deserves a lot of criticism. When when we talk about this Raiders team, what are the storylines that have come out this Raiders? Uh, it even starts back to when they got Jimmy Garoppolo and pretty much sent Derek Derek Carr out the door. Is Jimmy Garoppolo the future? I really wouldn't have given up given up Derek Carr for Jimmy Garoppolo, but hey, but that was the, that was a story. Is Jimmy Garoppolo good enough to be a starting quarterback for this team? Um, another story was. Can this team compete in the division? I mean, you have Max Crosby. At the time, you had Chandler Jones. You have Devontae Adams. You have Josh Jacobs. You signed him. You have Jacoby Myers. Pretty good. Okay, pieces. He's Jacoby Myers has been great for this team. Is this team good enough to compete in the AFC West? Then things were just going downhill, and then it was, uh, well, what's next for Devontae Adams? Is Devontae Adams going to make a trade? Is Devontae Adams, you know what I'm saying? One thing that I've not heard is criticism with, or one storyline that I have not heard about um, this Raiders team is criticism from the head coach. Is... Is Josh, let me say this. I've heard is Josh McDaniels the right fit for this team, but it's clear cut that Josh McDaniels isn't that good of a coach. I just keep it a being with you. Josh Downs is not that good of a coach. He has not shown that he is that good of a coach. I just don't understand why he keeps getting chances like this. I know, shouts out to the Vegas Aces. I know Mark Davis is right now worried about the Vegas Aces and and they just had their parade. Shouts out to them. But, yo, your your football team is kind of struggling, my guy. <laughs> like, like, tremendously. And a lot of it is because your head coach is not a good head coach. Bro, you lost to a, a, a Bears team that isn't good at all. Arguably one of the worst teams in football. You got destroyed by them. You lost by 18 points. Got to look at the coach, man. But shouts out to the Bears. Shouts out to you, Tyson. Atlanta Falcons beat the Buccaneers 16-13. to What I'm starting to see is you can tell when a, co- when a team is starting to coach around a player. And that's kind of what it's felt like, uh, in, except for – that's kind of what it's felt like with this – Falcons team first of all there's a (laughs) I know people are kind of confused how uh, B. John Robinson only had one carry uh, the whole game and they were saying he wasn't feeling well but I mean aren't you supposed to put that in the injury report and I I don't think they did so I know they're under investigation for that but you can a team the, the best you know a team knows what you're good at and what you're not good at you see them in practice you see them in games a team knows your team knows what you're good at and your team knows what you're not good at and the the object of of a coaching staff is to get the best out of his players and ultimately win the game what it seems like is this year they have coached around Desmond Ritter's throwing ability it doesn't seem like he has the best throwing ability and you can tell by throwing the ball 25 times. Now, you can look and say, all right, well, he threw for 250 yards. He also had zero touchdowns throwing the ball and zero interceptions. And you beat the Buccaneers 16 to 13. Yeah, they're, they're, this was, they pretty much won this game off the defense because, oh boy, Baker Mayfield is turning back to Baker Mayfield. He threw 42 times. Uh, 275 yards, one touchdown, one very costly interception. So, I know the interception happened in the what four, uh, fourth quarter. Yeah, 
It's very costly. So both of these teams, again, they're kind of they're kind of uh, leveling out. They they both started off to a really good start. Both the Bucks and the Falcons starting to level out. Now you're starting to you're starting to see the real Falcons and real Buccaneers, and neither team is good. In fact, hold up. <laughs> Just to be clear, because if I remember, yep, yep, three receptions. <laughs> Kyle Pitts, the the tight end that was supposed to revolutionize the position, and they drafted him fourth, I believe. Four targets, three receptions for forty-seven yards. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> It's just funny because it's like when you have a when you have a, I don't understand nobody understands because that's always a topic of conversation. How do you have somebody that you drafted as high as Kyle Pitts that's as good as Kyle Pitts and you don't use him? That to me is a and that's that is a referendum on the quarterback. And obviously they they don't believe in Desmond Ritter's throwing ability, so which sucks for any. Sucks for like a Drake London who had seven receptions or seven targets for four, 54 yards. Oh, boy. That's all I'm saying, man. It sucks. It sucks, man. This is the second year in a row that they have. And I know for sure because last year I had Kyle Pitts in my fantasy team. And when I tell you the – yo, <laughs> having a player – this is a side note. Having a player as good as Kyle Pitts on your team in fantasy and them never throwing him the ball really makes you second guess your fantasy your your GM skills in fantasy. And it really makes you upset with players that you really shouldn't be upset with. Because again, at the end of the day, it's just a game. But when I tell you <laughs> Some of the anger that I had towards uh that I that I had towards um Marcus Mariota last year. Boy oh boy. And now Desmond Ritter. Hey man, shouts out to the Falcons for beating the Bucks, man. Hey, I talked about Miles Garrett. And I said that he's could be one A and one B as the best defensive players in the league. One B or one A could is TJ Watt. TJ Watt is another player that won the game for his team. This, I mean, Kenny Pickett through twenty. That's that's the that is it right there. That is the number between twenty three and twenty six, twenty seven. That is when you know you're. You can't really throw the ball like that. That is the amount of time that your quarterback throws the ball. Can you pick it 17 for 25, 230 yards? This defense, this offense still ain't that good. Najee Harris, 14 carries for 53 yards. Jalen Warren, six carries for 32 yards. Both of them have touchdowns. This game was won off of the energy and off of the back pretty much of T.J. Watt. And T.J. Watt. Well, is considered should be considered one of, if not the best defensive player in the league. And you're going against, uh, you're going against Aaron Donald, and Aaron Donald pretty much did nothing. So, yeah, man, this is yeah, that that this that's the other game, and that's the other team, the Steelers, that. First of all, continue to find a way to win. They're four and two. With how bad their offense is, they have one of the worst offenses in football, and they're four and two. That is a Mike Tomlin record right there. This is a Mike Tomlin coach team. Hey, bro, shouts out to them. That's all I can do. Shouts out to the Steelers for beating the Rams twenty four to seventeen. And you have arguably the best defensive player in football in TJ Watt. I I know I was wrong. I, don't get me wrong, Michael Parsons and Nick Bosa is good, but there's levels. And right now, there's them two, and there's a level above, and that is TJ Watt and Miles Garrett. So, shout out to them. And the last game was the Steelers, no, Seahawks, 
beating the Cardinals twenty to ten. I know what the I know what you guys are doing. I know what the Arizona Cardinals are doing. They're trying to prolong this Kyle Murray thing, which I I understand. It's like you're you're pretty much tanking for Caleb. It's what's the point of trying to be good? You're not that good. Now they play hard. Don't get me wrong. They play very hard, but you Joshua Dobbs threw nine through thirty three times and finished with a hundred and forty six yards. I understand. I I know what's happening. They're not that good. The Seahawks are much much better, uh, but yeah, Kenneth Walker had twenty six carries for a hundred and five yards. Damn, they just bludgeoned the freaking Cardinals, man. Yeah, shouts out to the Seahawks for being the Cardinals 10, 20 to ten. Let's. Move over to baseball for a second. And the Rangers did something that obviously I didn't think was possible or able to happen. They beat the Astros in the ALCS. And now they await, again, as I'm recording this, the Phillies and the Diamondbacks are or haven't played game seven yet. I think they're playing tonight. So I don't know who is going to be in the World Series. I might do a little. Of course, I'll talk about it more on Saturday. But right now, it's just the Rangers. And the Rangers did something that obviously hasn't happened since, what, 2016 or 19? And that is... Prevent either the Astros or the Dodgers from being in the World Series. Again, when we talk about comparisons and we talk about the Astros, the team that obviously they get compared to is the Patriots. And that's usually because of just the sheer dominance that they have on baseball. And when you have, yo, let me tell you something. The de- First of all, the Rangers have not been to the World Series since 2011. And the thing that, so in the postseason, right? In the postseason, you can't just have one thing go right. Because the teams are usually so evenly matched you can't just have, like, for instance, you can't just have great pitching and absolutely no hitting. You can't have all hitting, all hit power in the world and no pitching. That's kind of what we're seeing with the Phillies right now. They're pitching, they're, they're hitting. Yo, Kyle Schwarber is destroying balls. Balls. Bryce Harper, like, they are hit, but their pitching isn't hasn't really been good this this series against the Diamondbacks. Again, I don't know what's happening. I will probably do a little short or something. I don't know. But we'll talk about it. As of right now, their pitching hasn't been great. In fact, the games that they've won, their pitching has been good. The games that they've lost, nah. You, first and foremost, the, the Rangers as a whole has been very good but when when you're playing somebody at least in this series it shouldn't have been as evenly matched as it was the there's a reason why I picked the Houston Astros to win this world series is because they just they're the patriots man they're they're that good Adolis Garcia if I said your name, first name wrong, I apologize. But Adolis Garcia, Adolis Garcia, won the Rangers, the ALCS. He was the main reason. In fact, let me, in game seven, he went four for five, three runs, two home runs. One or five RBIs. That's just one game. 
I think he's the first player ever to record what two home runs in multiple ALCS games. He obviously won the ALCS MVP. I again, right now, I don't know what's going on with the Diamondbacks and um, Diamondbacks and Phillies. But what I do know is if Garcia, Garcia has been the MVP of the playoffs right now, you can pretty much debate between him and Bryce Harper or him and Kyle Schwarber. But this is probably one of the first times in a while that you're seeing a player rise up and carry a team in, in baseball in the postseason. You, again, usually it's great pitching, or usually it's a multitude of hitters. Adolis Garcia is the reason why the Texas Rangers are in the World Series. And I don't know who's in the World Series, but I do know that as outside, you know, in the NL, I don't know who's in the World Series as we speak, but it's going to be hard pressed to beat someone, to beat the Texas Rangers in the World Series with Garcia playing like this. So, shouts out to them for dethroning last year's World Series champion in uh, the Houston Astros. Basketball is back. Basketball is back and we had you know two games tonight again I'm recording this before these games start and I wanted to give a brief uh, again last episode I gave my top 10 teams going into the season what I want to do is I want to give a brief breakdown of each division because a lot of people don't even know that there are six divisions in basketball you know the eastern conference and western conference but you don't people don't really know about the atlantic or central or southeast or northwest so i wanted to give a quick breakdown of every single division and what i expect coming into the season again i know that the game started tonight but you know hey let's start with the atlantic you have the Boston Celtics, Brooklyn Nets, New York Knicks, Philadelphia 76ers, and Toronto Raptors. I'll start with the Raptors. I think this is going to be a tough year for the Raptors. I think that this is going to be a year where you lose Fred Van Vliet. And I think that they're kind of torn between something that the Golden State Warriors were struggling with. They're trying to win now, and they're trying to build for the future. Like, you have Scotty Barnes. But then you also have Pascal Siakam, and that doesn't really work. You have to be committed with something. You have to be committed with winning now, or you have to be committed with building for the future. There is no in between. And again, we saw that with the Golden State Warriors. They tra- they had John the- or have John the Kaminga. They had Jordan Poole. They had James Wiseman, Moody. They also have Steph, Clay, Dre. It, it just doesn't work. The two timeline thing doesn't work. I think that's what the Toronto Raptors are struggling with. And on top of that, they don't have that good of a team. I think that they're probably going to they're probably going to be the worst team in the Atlantic. Uh and I like Pascal, but I don't know if he's going to remain on this team by the trade deadline. Especially when you give us someone like Fred Van Vliet. I I don't know. Uh so then you have the Brooklyn Nets. I I'm interested to see What's going to happen with Ben Simmons? I know Ben Simmons has looked pretty good in the preseason, but, you know, and and I think that this team has pieces to be an interesting team to watch. Again, Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, you have have Ben Simmons, Nick Claxton. I just don't – I don't think that this team is good enough to be like a playoff team because you need that star, especially in today's NBA – but I do think that the Brooklyn Nets are an interesting team. And I, I want to see if I will say this, if Ben Simmons can get back to his all star ways, which I don't think he will. But I'm again, I'm just going off of history here. If you can go back to his all star ways and you, you you might be able to see yourself in a play in. Maybe. I don't know. I just don't see it. I, I would love to be wrong. And if I am wrong, I obviously will come in here and say that I'm wrong. So. 
I don't. I just don't see it, man. I don't see it. But I do think the Brooklyn Nets will be exciting because anytime you come off of the the Olympics, usually you have your best year, and you had Cam Johnson in the Olympics, you had Mikael Bridges in the Olympics. I think they're going to be really good. I just don't think that they're going to be like maybe playoff, maybe play in, maybe first round playoffs. I don't know, but a lot is riding and banking on Ben Simmons being good. So we'll see. Then you have the Philadelphia 76ers. I've talked about the James Harden situation ad nauseum. I will say that I do think that at this point it's better with subtra- you know ad- addition by subtraction. I know that you're not going to get the value that you want for James Harden, but I don't think that James Harden is the the player that sh- – I mean, it just seems like he's more toxic than anything at this point for the 76ers. And when you have a a season as fragile as this season could possibly be for the 76ers, I don't think that you really want to be dealing with that James Harden situation. So I would just try to get off him as as whatever the hell the Clippers are offering you because it doesn't seem like James Harden has much of a market. I know Tim Legler said that. It's like, how do you trade for a player that – you need to change your whole offense around or change your whole identity around. But he's not the same player that even warrants that. It on top of that, like like you're you're not getting a player that's a bona fide proven star in the playoffs. And you're not getting a player that, while yes, he averaged or he finished first in assists last year, you're you're not getting a star. I don't think James Harden is a star anymore. And he's become more of a problem than a solution for any team at this point. So I just think that it's best to just get off of James Harden if you're Philly. And on top of that, you have some solid pieces. I mean, again, you have the reigning MVP in Joel Embiid. You have Tyrese Maxey. You still have P.J. Tucker playing defense. Like, I just think you want – I don't think that this team obviously is a – championship contender especially without James Harden and even with James Harden I don't know if they have been but I do know that you have Joel Embiid and that alone is 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 better than what most people have I just I just don't know man to me it's there I don't have I will say this I need to see Joel Embiid getting out the second round of the play or getting to the second round of the playoffs or out of the second round like come on now but I just don't have much faith in this Philadelphia Philadelphia 76ers. It's been such a loud offseason. And usually when you have a loud offseason, that doesn't bode well for you at all. So you have the New York Knicks. I think that they will finish as the second best team in this division. You have Jalen Brunson. He's been really good, and he just came off the Olympics. There's a lot of promising pieces. I have to see if you can – if if – Julius Randle can fit into a system. Right now, it hasn't seemed like, well, fit into the system as a second option. Right now, it has not shown that he's able to do that. And I don't know. But if he's able to and if he, if he, it looks like everything that he's saying is good, then the Knicks are going to be pretty good. RJ, we need to see a leap from RJ Barrett. We thought that last year was going to be the case. It had, it wasn't. <laughs> We need to see a leap from R.J. Barrett. If if we do, this team can make some noise. There, there's people that's projecting this team to make it to the NBA Finals. I don't know who the hell thinks that's the case. But this team is good enough to definitely make a deep playoff run. It's just things need to click. Mitchell Robinson's pretty good. Uh, you also have Dante DiVincenzo. We need a deep playoff run, and we need—I just need to see it. But this team is going to be really good. And then you have the Boston Celtics. <laughs> Boston Celtics. I'm actually—I'll—I'll I'll give my predictions of NBA Finals and stuff at the end of the episode or end of the show. But the Boston—I'm—I'm I'm really the Boston Celtics on paper, at least, is probably the best team in basketball. But as we saw last year, they were arguably the best team on paper last year. It's just they 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 flamed out in the in the second or Eastern Conference Finals. 
getting Drew Holiday, I talked about this before, but getting Drew Holiday was huge for this team. And it's hard for me. I think it is a massive failure if this team doesn't at least, at minimum, make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. When you look at the landscape of the East, I don't see another team outside of maybe one that should compete with this team. That's how good the Boston Celtics should be. Now, as we saw, especially last year, we don't know. But I think it's a when you have Porzingis, when you have Drew Holiday now, on the, you know what it is? All of this, all everything that goes through the Boston Celtics goes through Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum is the main, obviously he's the best player on the team, but Jason Tatum, how he's playing dictates what's going to happen. Now, I know that's easier or that's obvious, but Jason Tatum plays point guard most of the time. Jason Tatum shoots most of the shots, and it's pretty much like a back and forth between him and Jalen Brown. Well, that's one of the biggest reasons why Malcolm Brogdon didn't work for this team because Malcolm Brogdon wasn't allowed to play or they didn't use him as a traditional point guard. Jason Tatum had the ball most of the time. So if that's going to continue to happen, Jason Tatum needs to be better at facilitating with the ball. He needs to be better at, you know, uh, running plays. If that if, if he's not if he doesn't do that, then they're very beatable. If, if he's going to continue to have the ball as much as he has the ball, he is very beatable. So but but it's hard for me to see a team outside of one, really, see a team in the East that can compete with the Boston Celtics in a seven-game series. So that's the Atlantic. Let's go over to the Central, which consists of the Chicago Bulls, Cleveland Browns, Detroit Pistons, Indianapolis Pacers, and Milwaukee Bucks. Let's start with, to me, the team that's probably going to be the worst, and that's because of youth. This... This division is, <laughs> you have such crazy storylines for every every team. For instance, let's start with the Detroit Pistons. Detroit Pistons is one of the youngest teams in basketball, and nobody has expectations. This is one of those development teams, and what I mean by that is you don't expect much positive from this team outside like wins and losses. What you expect is, okay, you have – Jaden Ivey, okay, you have Cade Cunningham, you have uh, Jalen Duran, like you, you expect, you expect them to develop. James Wiseman, who's going to be their backup, uh, Marvin Bagley, who's going to be their backup. You, this, this team is going to be exciting to watch, I think, because when you have youth like that, they're they might not play the best brand of basketball or the smartest brand of basketball, but it is exciting to watch. So. I do think that we're going to get that from from the Detroit Pistons. I don't I I'm interested to see how they integrate somebody as integral and as ball dominant as Cade Cunningham. They have a lot of guards and they have a lot of youth and they have a lot of players that are good enough to demand the ball. And now yes, Cade Cunningham probably is the best, but I want to see how that dynamic works out. How does him and Jaden Ivey play for a whole season together? Uh, and how are the touches going to be divvied? So I'm interested to see what the Detroit Pistons are going to look like. I just don't think they're going to be good. I mean, usually young teams also are not good defensively. I don't think the Detroit Pistons are going to be good defensively at all. But I do think they're going to be interesting to watch. So you have that. Now you have the Indianapolis, pa- Indianapolis Indiana Pacers. And you have arguably one of the best young talent in basketball in Tyrese Halliburton. You have Miles Turner. Uh, you just got Bruce Brown from the Denver Denver Nuggets. I just – this team is going to be good. I just don't I, – I know the direction they're going in. 
they, they, I know when you give Tyrese Halliburton the contract that they gave him, you're pretty much handing over the team to him. And I don't know what's going to happen with this Buddy Hill situation. I know that he's going to start the season, obviously, with the Pacers. But I don't know if he's going to be on this Pacers team by trade deadline. I just don't... <laughs> I, just, I don't know the direction of which this pace. I, I, for this, I know the direction. I just don't know if they're fully committed with that. I need to see what happens with the Buddy Hill situation because it feels like they're really building for the future. But if you're building for the future, I understand he's younger, but why did you pay Miles Turner if you've been trying to get a, him for a while? And if you're building for the future, why is Buddy Hill still on the team? I, I get what you're trying to do, but – uh, here's the thing, man. If you're uh, the what the ultimate goal should be a championship, and you should do everything in your power to get there. And it's just I don't know what the Pacers are doing. I, I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to be fun to watch at times because how, Tyrese is pretty good. But I just don't know the direction that they're going in. Another team that I don't know that I do know the direct. I don't know the direction they're going in. That's the Chicago Bulls. In fact, I do know the direction. They're going down. <laughs> I understand. It's tough when you think that you're building your your whole offense around a player like, you know, uh, a player like Lonzo Ball. Like, you think that's going to be your offense. And when you have Lonzo Ball, when you have Zach Levine, when you have DeMar DeRozan, of course that works. And you don't have, you know, you, you don't have Lonzo Ball with the with the whole foot injury, and you expect Alex Caruso to play more point guard than he expects, and now you have what Patrick Beverly, I think. No, he plays for the Sixers. All, all I'm saying is, this Bulls team is is a bunch of one dimensional players, and it's a bunch of players that do the same exact thing. Like they don't have a lot of diversity on this team. They don't have a lot of, you know, 3 and D players. They don't have a lot of shooters at all. They don't have a lot of players that can really put the ball on the ground. They may have one or two, but neither one of those two, DeMar DeRozan or Zach Levine, play defense. So this team is just stuck. This you To me, you're, the worst situation, the worst situation in the NBA is the Chicago Bulls situation. Like, what do you do with DeMar DeRozan? What do you do with Zach Levine? What do you do? You wait for all of them, or do you wait for Zach or Lonzo Ball? But that takes yet another year away from those. It's that is just a bad situation for the Chicago Bears Bulls. Trash, trash. <laughs> You have the Cleveland Browns or Cleve. Why do I keep saying Cleveland? You have the Cleveland Cavaliers, and they have their team is built so bad, poorly, bro. That I don't think. I mean, I know the reports are saying that Donovan Mitchell might not resign with this team, but they're built so badly. They're built. They have two offensive weapons, and that's it. They have Donovan Mitchell, they have Darius Garland, then you have Akura, then you have Jonathan Allen, or yeah, then you have um, Evan Mobley, none of which are offensive players. So it's like, as you saw that in the playoffs, if, oh boy, if Donovan Mitchell or Darius Garland don't have it, they have no one else to turn to. I know Karis LeVert, but Karis LeVert is on and off. And he pretty much he'd be freelance a lot. So I don't this Cleveland team is built poorly. They're gonna win games, obviously. I think Donovan Mitchell is definitely a regular season player, but kind of like we see with some players, they just flame out in the playoffs every year, and that's Donovan Mitchell. Uh but we don't even know if Allen and Mobley can play together. So uh, that's a crazy situation right there. I don't I don't know. I don't know. This I don't know. And then you have the Milwaukee Bucks. That I was just talking about the Celtics and I was talking about the Atlantic. The Milwaukee Bucks is the only team that I can see competing with or possibly beating the Boston Celtics. There is this is probably the first year in his career that there are true championship expectations for Damian Lillard. 
and I'm and I'm interested to see how he navigates it. I don't think he's gonna be bad. I don't think I I think he's gonna be pretty good actually. But he has championship aspirations and or there's championship expectations on his on his shoulders. He is built even with Giannis, he is built or he is viewed as the quote unquote missing piece for this Milwaukee Bucks team. And rightfully so, especially when you talk about the offensive struggles when half court offensive struggles to be specific specific with this Milwaukee Bucks team he is looked at as the the piece that can fix that and he takes pressure off of Chris Middleton as the only before Damian Lillard Chris Middleton was the only player that can really put the ball on the ground and get a jump shot off now you have arguably the greatest offensive weapon outs at the point guard position outside of Steph Curry. Yeah. I I'm we'll talk about it in a second, but spoiler alert, the the two teams I have in the Eastern Conference Finals is the Boston Celtics and the Milwaukee Bucks. And I'll give my prediction about who I think is going to win a little bit later, but that's the central. And then you got the Southeast. Shouts out to my Wizards. The Southeast to me it's not wide open, but it's not, it's probably yeah, it's probably the worst division of <laughs> basketball. Yeah, it's probably the worst division of basketball, man. You got the Heat, the Hawks, Orlando, the Wizards, Charlotte. Um, I'll start off with my Wizards. They're going to be bad this year. That's the that's what I think their goal is. They're trying to get draft picks. They're, I will say that I do think that Jordan Poole is probably going to win most improved because he, I think Jordan Poole is going to put up some godly numbers because he just has the green light. And you're not really expecting the Wizards to win. You're expecting they, – they really want to be bad, but – they don't really have another player outside of Kyle Kuzma that's really dependable. I am interested to see what how Trey Jones looks like, and I forgot I don't know how to say the dude's name, but the guy that we got from the draft, he looks like a three and D player. I know that they just got or Danny Avdia. I know that they just signed him to a contract, very movable contract. I know what they're doing there. Um, I, Jordan Poole's gonna put up some numbers. He's gonna put up some numbers, uh, but. The Wizards aren't going to be that good. As a team, the Wizards are trash. So, yeah. But I am I think they're going to be one of the more fun teams to watch. I'm not just saying this as a Wizards fan. I'm saying this as a, a person that knows. Yo, Jordan Poole put up 41 points in a preseason game. The next game, he scored like four. So, that's just the roller coaster ride that Jordan Poole is. So, that's what's going to be. The Orlando Magic is arguably or probably one of the youngest teams in basketball. They have an ass load of guards. I don't know what they're trying to do. Jalen Suggs, uh, what well, Anthony Black, I think. You got Mar Mar uh, Markel Fultz, like yeah, Cole Anthony. They just gave a contract to. I don't. They got an ass load of guards. Now they do have Fonz. Uh, they have uh, Fonz Wagner, who is a beast, but. The Orlando Magic, man. Mm. They're they're just they're gonna be fun to watch because they're young and like I said, most young teams are are decent offensively. They just don't play no defense. I just don't know what the Orlando Magics are doing as far as the guard play. I don't I don't know. Uh, I think that they're probably gonna be not good again. And that's another thing. How long does a rebuild take? <laughs> like, if you're going to rebuild, you have to have smart people in place. You have to make right draft decisions. You have to make right trade decisions because the Orlando Magic have been rebuilding since Dwight Howard left the team. Like, all right, now, that's that's been a while. Dwight Howard's out the league at this point. So what are we doing here? So, yeah. Another team that's not going to be good to me is the Charlotte Hornets. Yeah, you have LaMelo, but they have had a loud offseason, whether it's uh, uh, Miles Bridges, whether that's Kai Jones that they just released. It's, oh boy, 
And on top of that, they don't they don't even have that good of a team. I know you have Gordon Hayward, who can't stay healthy, unfortunately. You have Terry Rozier, LaMelo Ball again, but PJ Washington. I don't see much I don't see much from this team, honestly, to be completely honest with you. Um yeah. Yeah. You also have the Atlanta Hawks. And that's this is the team that I think people are growing more frustrated with year after year because you have a top player, a top tier player in the East in Trey Young, but and I know you went to I think the Eastern Conference Finals once a couple years ago. It was against the Milwaukee Bucks, but they they have not seen any type of improvement. I know they just let John or they just sent John Collins to the Jazz, but I don't I don't see much excitement from the Atlanta Hawks outside of Trey Young. I know you have Griffin from Duke. He's good. Um, Sadiq Bay, Sadiq Bay. That they didn't give a contract to. I know you have Clint Capella, but they have nothing to really be excited about outside of Trey Young. That is the Atlanta Hawks. And then you have the Miami Heat. I went I've talked about them at nauseum as far as it was a tough off season for them. A bunch of targets. They tried to get in with trades or free agency that they ultimately didn't get. But I do think that they are, by default, the best team in the Southeast, and I do think that they're going to be one of the teams, especially when we talk about the playoffs and how Jimmy Butler elevates his game in the playoffs. I think they're going to be a team to – to a dangerous team come playoff time. I mean, I don't foresee last year happening again, but, I again, this team has a – they're good enough to make some noise. So – I think that they're going to obviously win the NFC or Southeast, and we'll see. Let's go over to the Northwest, the Western Conference. You have the Denver Nuggets, Minnesota Timberwolves, Portland Trail Blazers, Oklahoma City Thunder, and Utah Jazz. Let's start with a team that's obviously going to be the worst. That is the Portland Trail Blazers. Their two best players at this very moment is Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simon. One player has not played yet. I just I, uh, oh, I will say the Charlotte Hornets do, does have Brandon Miller. Um, yeah, the Portland Trailblazers aren't going to be that good. I know they did get a they got DeAndre Ayton, so there's that. <laughs> but you lose Damian Lillard, and uh, I mean you got DeAndre Ayton. There's that. So I don't see much. I don't think Portland's going to be that good, to be honest with you. Um, now, to me, they're going to rival them as far as being the worst in the division between them and the Utah Jazz. I think Utah Jazz had an incredible year last year, even though they ultimately fell off towards the end. But I think that was kind of by design. Lori Markkinen was great. Walker Kessler was great. Jordan Clarkson was great. You still have Colin Sexton. Now you have John Collins, which I don't know how he fits on this team. But I think that they're going to be interesting. I don't think that what happened last year is going to happen this year as far as as good as they are. But I think they're going to be interesting. And they're still – trying to be bad (laughs) now it didn't work too well last year but they're still trying to be bad that is their goal and I don't I don't foresee a lot of winning with the Utah Jazz this year or the Portland Trail Blazers one and one both are pretty young teams but one team is actively trying to be bad and that's the Jazz one team is just young and has DeAndre Aiden so that's the thing (laughs) so Then you have the Minnesota Timberwolves, man. The Minnesota Timberwolves is so interesting because you have one of the best young players in basketball in Anthony Edwards. You have Carl Anthony Towns. You have Rudy Gobert. All three players I don't think can play together. 
Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns, especially in today's NBA, has obviously shown that they can't really play together and be an effective, good team. Like, I know they made the playoffs. You have Mike Conley and everything, but the Minnesota Timberwolves, there's no, Nazi Reed's good, but Nazi Reed's is a better fit alongside Carl Anthony Towns because both players can kind of step out and shoot a three. Rudy Gobert cannot. So I just don't, I just don't see much positive with the Minnesota Timberwolves as far as outside of Anthony Edwards being one of the best young players and you have Carl Anthony Towns but is he going to be on this team by the trade deadline I don't know because they're the pieces that they have have shown that they don't it's not like you you're guessing if they can fit or not they have shown that they can't fit so I don't know but that's the Minnesota Timberwolves a team that I, I said this I said this uh, last episode, a team that I am extremely high on is the Oklahoma City Thunder. I, I, I think that they're going to be very good this year. I am banking a lot, especially what I saw in the preseason. I'm banking a lot on Chet Holmgren being good. I think that he is going to be in the running and have a very good case of being the rookie of the year between him and Victor. We'll talk about Victor in a second. Shea Gilge Alexander, I think that, I mean, he made first team all NBA last year. While I don't know if that's going to happen again, I do think that he's going to make that leap. And he, I mean, he was great for Team Canada. Josh Giddy is really good. He was good for Australia. Like, I, this this team is good. The J, Jalen Williams, both of them, this team is good. And defense when you have a team as young as they are defense is a thing that kind of holds you back but you do have Lou Dort he's one of the most underrated defenders in basketball I think that the Oklahoma City Thunder is going to be really good I think that they're going to be good enough to maybe make the playoffs and and maybe have something to say in the playoffs that's how good I think they can be they have Denver Nuggets uh you have arguably the best player in basketball, Nikola Jokic. You have Jamal Murray. You have Michael Porter Jr. You have Aaron Gordon. You have KCP. They just won an NBA championship. There's nothing that I've seen to make me think that they will not be in the running, at least, to have something to say about who's in the NBA Finals. I'm not saying that they're ultimately going to win it or even me in it, but what I'm saying is they're still, yeah, they lose Bruce Brown, but you also have Christian Braun, and I think he's going to be play a very important part for this team. The Denver Nuggets, to me, they're probably, I mean, they're amongst the best teams in basketball still. So, And you have a player in Nicole Jokic that is probably the best, if not – one of the best players in, in the entire NBA. So there's that. Then you have the best division in basketball, and that is the Pacific Division. You have the Golden State Warriors, L.A. Clippers, Los Angeles Lakers, Phoenix Suns, and Sacramento Kings. All Every single team in that division made the playoffs last year. I think – so the interesting thing about this division is – a lot of a, you, all of these teams are banking on something to to work. Now that that happens with every team, but what I'm saying is all all six of these four five all five of these teams are good enough to make some noise and play. All good. All six of five of these teams are good enough to make make an NBA Finals. Last year, the Sacramento Kings were one of the best. Actually, I think the number one offense in the league. I think they're also the best away team in the league. And you have the last year most clutch player in the league in De'Aaron Fox. You have Demonis Sabonis. Sabonis. You have Keegan. Murray. Like he, this team can run you off the court. That's how good the Sacramento Kings are. Now, they, they they were very young last year, and they didn't play much. In fact, they were one of the worst defenses in basketball. If they're able to rectify that, then obviously this team is an NBA champion or NBA finals uh, 
contender, but they have one of the best def- offenses in basketball. For the Phoenix Suns, you have Kevin Durant, you have Devin Booker, now you have Bradley Bill. Now, defensively, they are not the best, but they have the opportunity to be one of the most prolific offenses we've ever seen. You have two players at least in actually yeah you have two players at least that can go off for 60 points in any given night then you have one player in bradley bill that led the league in scoring two years in a row (laughs) now defensively again i don't i don't know if they're going to be able to hold up defensively but they are to me this team is banking on them scoring more than anyone so I, i think that this it's going to be interesting how the Suns play it. I know that they build out like a, a makeshift roster pretty much outside of those three. I know you have Bo Bowl. You you have some pieces. Torian Craig is still there. But, yeah, the Suns, the Suns are going to try to outscore you. And they have the opportunity. They have the, they have the pieces, too. You have three offensive weapons, two of which – one of which arguably is the greatest offensive weapon in NBA history and Kevin Durant. So, the Lakers are banking. Now, they're not the best three-point shooting team. But they weren't the best three-point shooting team last year. And last year, they made it to the Western Conference Finals. What they are is they're a team that's built around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They have Austin Reeves, who has blossomed into a very capable and very solid third piece. And you have just players. They were one of the best defensive teams in basketball going into the playoffs and actually in the playoffs. What they're banking on is, of course, Anthony Davis to play like a top five player because when he is on, he is a top five player in the league. And you're banking on the complementary pieces that they got this offseason, whether that's Torian Prince, whether that's Cam Reddish, whether that's Gabe Benson, they're hoping that they're able to hit some open threes because they're going to get some open threes. So I think that this Lakers team is going to be good. I think that this Lakers team is going – if they're if the pieces hit like they're supposed to hit, this team is good enough to, to win a championship, obviously. I just don't know when, especially in today's NBA, when you don't have the the, when you're not as good shooting threes as other teams. Like the Denver Nuggets was one of the best three point shooting teams last year. They obviously won. I just don't, you know, I don't know if that's gonna fare well for the Lakers, but they can bank bank on. They have arguably the best one two punch in basketball right now, and Le- LeBron James, and Anthony Davis when they're both on. And they can go in as the best defensive team. And they are a big team. Like, they're huge paws. So, the Clippers. The Clippers are banking on health. Now, I don't know how long you can bank on health with this Clippers team. Because, as we've seen throughout the entire Kawhi Leonard tenured, he or Paul George or both have not been healthy. Uh, But... If they're able to stay healthy, which is a big if, I don't know if that's even possible, but if they're able to stay healthy, you have one of the best trios in basketball in Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and Russell Westbrook. And then you have a pretty solid team around you, whether that's Norman Powell, whether that's uh, Zubats. Like, they're good enough to be that good. It's just they have to stay healthy. And I know that at this point, is de- that's kind of like saying Anthony Davis is going to play a whole season. I'm not trying to take shots, but that's just in the grand scheme, in the history of Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, they have not – and Anthony Davis, they have not been reliable throughout an entire season. So, And for Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, more Kawhi Leonard than Paul George, he hasn't been healthy or reliable in the playoffs either. So – I don't know. Health wise, they're if they stay healthy, which is a huge if and if they're good and they're good enough, obviously, to win a championship. But we haven't seen it. We have not seen it in the entire tenure of Kawhi Leonard being there. So with the Golden State Warriors, you're hearing a lot of reports saying that the team chemistry is back up and they needed Last year they were burnt out, and now they feel more re- rejuvenated and energized with Chris Paul being on the team. And I think reports are saying he's going to come off the bench. Thank God. But they're they're banking on a lot. They're banking on 
hitting threes. Now you have arguably the greatest, not arguably, you have inarguably the greatest shooting backcourt in NBA history. You have the, on inarguably the greatest shooter in NBA history. And I just, what I don't, I, I cannot get that Lakers series out of my head. I can't get how bad they looked out of my head. I just can't. And as far as defensively, they need size. Now I know Dario Sarge was a big get for them. And I know he's six ten, I think, but yo, the, they need someone like a JaVale McGee, or they need someone that, why don't you go get a Hassan Whiteside? I'm not saying you need to get him to be an offensive anchor. You just need him. You need size against someone like a Lakers team or someone like a Clippers. I, 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 you know what I'm saying? I just, you can't, I, don't get me wrong. Come on, Looney is an incredible big, and he's one of the most, he's like a modern day Ben Wallace as far as rebounding. Or not, not Ben Wallace. Modern day Dennis Rodman as far as rebounding. Undersized, but one of the best rebounders in basketball. He, but the, 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 he's still undersized. And as we saw against the Lakers, when you're playing someone that knows how to use their size and someone that's better, i.e. Anthony Davis, it was barbecue chicken. So, I mean, it got so bad that they tried to put Jermichael Green on Anthony Davis. Like, come on, bro. So, the Pacific Division... All of these teams are going to, to me, if think if they click the way they're supposed to click, if Golden State gets a big, maybe at the, towards the trade deadline or something, if the Lake, if the Clippers are able to stay healthy, if the Lakers, if they're able to go in as the best defensive team in basketball, if the Suns outscore you and the Kings can run you off the floor, all of these teams are good enough to be NBA championship caliber teams we just have to see and then you have the southwest division <laughs> you have the new orleans pelicans you have the dallas mavericks houston rockets san antonio spurs and memphis grizzlies let's start with the houston rockets i think they're going to be bad this year i know fred van vliet's on the team i know dylan brooks is on the team i think that they're going to be better and they kind of bring a veteran and a defensive presence to a team full of kids i mean you have what Eason, uh, you have Jalen Green, Sangoon, uh, not none of them play defense. And I think you have one of the Thompson brothers, I think, uh, Asan Thompson, I think. But I know Detroit has the other one. I just don't think that they're going to be good at all. And don't get me wrong, Fred Van Vliet is a solid guard, as well as Dylan Brooks as a good 3 and D player. But I don't know if they're able <laughs> – I don't know, like, what you're expecting. And you're about to – man, look, there's a difference between being in the East and being in the West as far as the guard situation. I know Damian Lillard changes a lot of things in the East, but any given night you'll be going up against Steph Curry or Devin Booker or Bradley Beal or – Kyrie Irving or or Luca or Ja Morant, that's that's or Jamal Murray. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. So, I just think the Rockets are going to be terrible. Memphis Grizzlies, they're going to be okay. I just don't know. How, I need to see how the the most important stretch of this season for them is the twenty five. I think games that Ja Morant is not going to play. Now I know that they're they have a history of playing better with John Morant out, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I need to see it. I mean, Jaron Jackson Jr. He, he he fouls out a lot, and he's gonna need to play more minutes. I know you get Mike Marcus Smart, but I mean, I don't know if Marcus Smart or Derrick Rose because you got him as well. I don't know if they're able to fill the hole that John Morant's gonna fill, or is John Morant's gonna leave. And when he gets there, are you still in playoff contention? Or are you still amongst one of the best teams record-wise? Or are you still – are you above float? If you're if you're floating and then you get John Moran back, you're good. But if not, that's, that's going to suck. And I need to – I don't know. Uh, the Pelicans, it all goes down to – it all comes down to Zion. I know Zion looked good in the preseason. I know he lost weight or whatever. But – his health is the most important thing and there's a reason which i never really thought about it but there's a reason that 
as good as we think Brandon Ingram is, there's a reason why they're not that good with Brandon Ingram. Like, without Zion, they are a completely different team. They're not that good. Even though they have C.J. McCollum, even though they have Brandon Ingram, I mean, they made the playoffs, but Brandon Ingram, I mean, in the, in the biggest part, in the biggest situations when they needed him, he kind of disappeared. Same thing we saw with him in Team USA. So, <sighs> I, I, I think it's all on Zion. We know when Zion plays, he is arguably a top 10 player. That's how good he is. It's just he needs to stay healthy. So then you have the Dallas Mavericks. And I think the Dallas Mavericks, they're going to win this division, I think. But they're banking a lot on Derek Lively, the second out of Duke. Because they still don't play no type of defense. And I am still, I'm not convinced that Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving is able to work together. Not because that they're not great players, but Luka hasn't really been able to work with anybody that's Luka's a, both of them, Kyrie Irving and Luka are ball dominant players. And you need someone to be able to you, Luka has not shown the ability to play off ball and neither really has Kyrie outside of LeBron James. So I don't know if they'll be able to work together. I don't. And defensively, that is probably one of the worst defensive backcourts in basketball. So, I don't know. I think they're going to be exciting. I think they're going to score a lot of points. I think Luka is one of the best players in basketball. I think Kyrie Irving is still one of the best players in basketball. But I don't know if they're the, the Dallas Mavericks are even – I mean, I know you got Grant Williams, but is that really changing the needle? I don't think so. I think they're going to be cool, but – not championship caliber. And then you have Sacramento Kings. Arguably, I will say this. Victor Wembanyama is he's a freak of nature. And Victor Wembanyama, he has an opportunity to be one of the best defensive players in basketball, or at least rim protectors. He has one of the he ha, boy what I've seen in this preseason from that guy. He is incredible. And he alone is why I don't think the the San Antonio Spurs are going to be the worst team in basketball. I don't know if he's good enough right now to propel them to maybe a play-in or playoff spot. I don't think so, but he is something. And he he is indescribable. Victor Wembanyama is incredible. To be 7-3 and a half, because that's what he said, he is 7-3 and a half, and to have the – Ability to do what he does. Now, I do. I am a little fearful of his stature, and hopefully, he doesn't get hurt because he is skinny as hell. But talent-wise, he is incredible. He boy. So that's 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 been the divisional breakdown. Um, I'm. I'll just speed through this. For my awards, I think the sixth man of the year is probably going to be Chris Paul. I think that, I mean, I hope he comes off the bench. That's the best place for him. And I think if he does come off the bench, that's the he's probably going to be the best bench player in basketball. So I think sixth man of the year is going to be Chris Paul. Coach of the year, I think, is going to be... Hmm. I think coach of the year is going to be... Uh, Ham, uh, was it De Devin Ham? No. Yeah, Ham from the Lakers. I think that the Lakers are going to be really good. And I think that – actually, I don't know because I don't think they're going to give any coach that coached LeBron coach of the year. I think I'm going to give it to Ty Lue. I think Ty Lue is, is due for coach of the year, uh, especially with this – I very stupidly am going to bank on this Clippers team being healthy. I know. I know, crazy. And I think they're going to be really good. And I got Ty, Ty Lu winning coach of the year. Defensive player of the year. I'm going to go with Anthony Davis. I know I've said Anthony Davis a couple of times now, and injuries have really affected him. But Anthony Davis has the ability not only to be a great rim protector and an incredible rim protector, but he has a the way that he has point guard type skills, he is great. So I have Anthony Davis as um, – I have Anthony Davis winning Defensive Player of the Year. MVP, 
I think it's going to be either between Giannis or or Nikola Jokic, and I think that they're going to give it to Giannis. I think Giannis is – actually, no, I think they're going to give it to Nikola Jokic because Giannis is – I think Damian Lillard being there is going to take some points away, and I think the Denver Nuggets are going to be as good as they were last year. I don't know if they're going to ultimately win the championship, but I think they're going to be as good as last year. Uh, so I have Nikola Jokic winning his third MVP. And NBA Finals – Right now, I have the Denver Nuggets going up against the. I hate to say it, Denver Nuggets going up against the Boston Celtics. I just think Drew Holiday is going to be a huge, huge piece to this team, especially defensively, and I think that his defense is going to. Have they're gonna need to Damian Lillard is gonna need to play defense in in the playoffs, especially against the Celtics, and I don't know if he's gonna be able to do that. So I have the Denver Nuggets and the Boston Celtics in the playoff in the NBA Finals. Ugh, Jesus Christ! Well, they ain't got no big. Mm. I have the Denver Nuggets repeating as NBA Finals. I think that Porzingis, I think Nicole Yoga is going to destroy Porzingis in the in the finals. So that's that. Um, those are my predictions. And lastly, the unpopular topic of the day, very fast. Yo, those those city jerseys, I, I don't understand why. The, I talked about this a little bit in the beginning. I don't understand why the NBA doesn't like let jerseys live at this point. I know you have the original home in the way, but... Why do they keep changing jerseys year after year after year after year? It's it's like, how are we going to get throwbacks anymore? Yo, and these city jerseys are god-awful. They are trash, terrible, basura. It is dumpster juice. Not one of them is... there. There's ones that's better than the others, but all of them suck. Like, it's, it's not good. And I don't understand. This batch just needs to throw it away. Like... I know what the Minnesota Timberwolves one, they kind of give dirty Sprite vibes, but oof, I don't, they they all suck. The the Wizards one is terrible. It's, oh boy, I don't get it. I don't understand why they keep doing this. I don't understand it. It's like, why did you get rid of the cherry? The cherry Blossoms happen every year. Why are you getting rid of the Cherry Blossoms jersey? Or the Golden State Warriors uh, little circle emblem why are you getting rid of that why did they get rid of the kobe jersey i just don't understand for the lakers i don't understand it like i don't get it i don't get it i don't understand it these jerseys suck and there you have it that's been today's episode of the unpopular podcast i truly truly appreciate it Hey, ooh, Jesus. <laughs> I truly, truly appreciate you guys. If you want a popular podcast shirt, hoodie, sweater, long sleeve joggers, the link in the description below. I have multiple different colors, multiple different designs. Get your unpopular podcast merch today. Also, please subscribe to the, wherever you're listening. Please subscribe to the YouTube. I'm trying to get the podcast to grow as much as I can. And anything helps. Tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And also follow the socials, follow Instagram, follow t TikTok. I pretty much post daily. I comment daily. We'll have conversations. Just keep it respectful and we'll talk about it. Leave it in the comments, even on YouTube. We'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll talk. Just keep it respectful. Uh, and until next time, much love.